we're going to go ahead and get started, if you're feeling ready. Um, like all great things, I think we always must begin with a brief delay. Um, but I feel very excited to be here in conversation with you all. Welcome to those who are here on live stream at HowlRound, um, day two of the Art New York Summit. And we are here um, to have a little panel discussion. It's titled The Advocators, Forging a Path, Paths to Better Pay. Um, my name is Sam Morielli. I use they, them pro pronouns. Um, I'm going to be moderating this panel with these incredible artists who you're going to get to meet in a moment. Uh, but before that, I do have a bit of a diatribe of grounding that I'd like to offer to the room. Um, again, a bit about me, um, Sam Morielli, they, them pronouns, moderating this discussion. I'm the associate producer at Soho Rep. Um, beyond that, my practice is really rooted in facilitation. That shows up in my producing, in my dramaturgy, in my directing. Um, and in just culture change in general, culture change work, um, which I'm so excited about. Um, and uh, I love, I just love the weaving together of things so that we can really materially understand, you know, where we're going, where we're heading, how to make concrete change together, which is really what this panel will be rooted in. Um, first and foremost, always, I want to start and ground us in a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm actually just going to read off Art New York's land acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that wherever we are currently located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and the Matinecock community. We want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. We also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there was stolen people. We want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. Um, it's important to me in my own practice of land acknowledgement that these words don't just stay on a page. It's very easy for us to just read off these acknowledgments, call it a day. Um, but these are words that are meant to be activated, like all of our words are meant to be. Um, so I also just want to take a moment to, in the spirit of that, um, acknowledge uh, and make space for all of the active, present, cur current, present day acts of colonization that we are seeing in the world. Many people are being erased. Many cultures are being erased. Um, and if these are words that we all believe, we actually need to be showing up and acting in those conversations. Um, so this may be a little untraditional for you, but I actually want to make space for us to process. Um, and I would love to just have like a literal minute of silence in which each of us can find ourselves in relationship to these words. And I would love for you to just think about one thing you can do today um, to be in service of indigenous people. What is one action, what step forward that you can take? Um, is it educating yourself? Is it donating to a cause? Is it actually building a friendship or relationship with somebody in your own community? Um, so I'd love to give us just one minute of silence. Feel free to write, um, figure out what your action step is.
And if you have that, I think I'd love to just set that intention and set that action with a breath together. Um, so if you just want to find yourself in a comfortable position um, and take a moment to just orient yourself, <coughs> remember that even though we're three floors up in a building currently here in Manhattan or wherever you might be at home, um, there's land beneath us, there's air around us, we are in relationship to water, and let's set our action and our commitment with just a breath. So on three, we'll breathe in, hold for three, and then breathe out. One, two, three, in, and hold, and out. All right. Another, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> we'll breathe in on three. One, two, three. Um, I'm ready to dive in. <laughs> uh, I have a bit more, I think I want to say, just to, to ground us in the conversation that we're here to have today. And then I'm going to throw it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, but I think that, you know, to start again, title of this panel, this conversation we're having today, The Advocators, Forging Paths to Better Pay. Um, I don't think that I need to tell anybody in this room that living is really hard. <laughs> uh, sustaining ourselves is very difficult. Uh, if you don't think that that's true, you might be part of a problem. Um, you might be a reason that somebody's not making rent this month. Not trying to attack anybody, but just trying to be real again about like the material conditions that we're really finding ourselves in. Um, I have a habit of speaking in generalizations and universalizations sometimes, uh, but I can say that in my experience in this industry, I found that we often find ourselves getting caught up uh, in our art making practice, in conversations about exceptionalism, how incredible the art making is, and the need to make art for art's sake. Um, and I, I have found that that removes us from the reality that actually all of the creative processes that we steward have workers attached to them whose livelihoods depend on those creative processes. Um, and inside of that, um, we're seeing, right, cost of living increases, costs of material needs are going up. Um, and I want to quote the incredible Kate McGee, who's a designer um, here in New York City and all over the world, um, who has said we're in an arms race of American theater design. Right, like people are, there's a very high competitive nature to the work that we are doing and to this aesthetic excellence that we're trying to achieve. And that is creating a ceiling um, that is unsustainable to me, right? Um, we're not actually effectively, in my opinion, um, telling stories. We're creating these like very extravagant experiences for people to come to, to see a really clean, beautifully done thing. Um, that takes so many dollars that I know I myself am wondering, is this actually where we want our money to be spent? Is this the best way for us to be producing? And are we setting unattainable bars for ourselves to keep achieving over and over and over and over again? Um, and of course, I don't need to tell anybody in this room, we also have a funding problem um, as a nonprofit generally run industry, right? Like we're all competing for the same resources from foundations, we're all competing for the same donors just to give us some scraps to help us do what we're doing. Um, and that is also in and of itself not really a realistic business model, um, even the way we sell our, our product under capitalism, not really helping us break even. Um, and this is just exacerbating, right, the kinds of livelihoods um, hopefully that we want to give ourselves if what we're seeking is um, a society and a culture where everybody is able to support themselves, um, able to sustain themselves, and in that able to be the fullest, most vibrant version of them that they can be. Um, and I think that it's, it's really not just this money problem, right? Like money, money feels like the obvious um, issue in front of us. But actually, I think that there are potentially difficult choices we need to make about our resourcing, about our structuring, that maybe, maybe, um, could help us be a bit more um, actively sustaining one another and in community. 
So that's really the conversation that I think that we are here to have today. Um, <coughs> I'm interested in what this kind of capitalist flaw we're identifying, that kind of crack in the system, what other issues does that reveal that need addressing in order to create our sustainability? Um, and I do believe that we have some incredible people here who can help us get deeper into that conversation. Um, so without further ado, I would love to uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, and if you could just share your name, um, your pronouns if you so choose, um, let us know what do you do in the field. Tell us a bit, feel free to, to go on a little diatribe to just tell us you know, um, all of the incredible spaces that you hold up. Um, and I'm curious, I know it's a bit of a vague question, but I'd love for you each to answer, what do you do it for? Anybody want to start? <laughs> I guess I'll start since I'm here. <laughs> since I'm sitting next to you. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Ife uh, Olujobi. Um, I uh, pronouns are she or they. Um, I'm a playwright in the theater. Um, yeah. And then what was the last question? <laughs> what do you do? What do I do it for? I mean, okay, I guess, right, the reason why I'm here is because, you know, I'm a playwright, but I've also, you know, had some conversations with some theaters about paying playwrights more money. Um, and that sort of has, I guess, become another part of my, I don't know, practice within the theater is to do that, um, you know, I think I've, you know, for better or worse, gained a reputation for that. Um, and what do I do it for? Um, I mean, I do, pers I, like, I do it for, you know, what I consider to be, you know, the younger generations of playwrights who have to, like, make a living, right? I mean, I do it for myself, I do it for my peers, but I also do it for, like, you know, I come from a large Nigerian family and, it was very um, not traditional or controversial for me to pursue a career in the arts. Like that was not something that was sort of a given and there were many you know, conversations and arguments that sort of led to, or sort of happened as, as a result of me wanting to do that. Um, but you know, now that I'm here and you know, my parents are like chill, um, <laughs> I do, uh, you know, I feel like I go back to visit them and sometimes, you know, my mom will be like, oh, you know, so-and-so cousin or this family friend or whatever, they have a kid and they are interested in theater or acting or drama and their parents are really scared and they don't know what to do. Like, can you go talk to them, essentially? Mm. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, and I'm happy to do that, but it's like, you know, I have to sit down with these young people and their parents and then be like, hey, like, this is my story, this is what happened to me, this is how I somehow magically, at least for now, am able to maintain a life in the arts, but like, you know, I, I do this basically because I wanna be able to tell them that okay, at least like I'm trying to sort of make things better for you and your child if they so choose to pursue this passion of theirs, you know, that hopefully I can sort of create a space where I'm not telling them to like go into this field knowing that it just like, is a complete dumpster fire and they're gonna, you know, not be paid any money. Like, I'm hoping that, you know, things that I can do can make it easier for um, these young people, just even the ones in my own life, um, who again, right, in this particular case happen to be, you know, immigrants and children of immigrants, um, who like oftentimes really need financial infrastructure in order to pursue a career um, in a particular field. So I'm hoping that, um, yeah, anything that I can do can make it easier for them to be able to do what they would like to do. Is that me? I think so. <laughs> Let's just go down the line. Okay. Um, my name is Emma Orm. I use she, her pronouns, and I, um, I'm an independent producer, a creative producer. Does anyone know what any of these words mean? No. <laughs> so I define it by the way I embody that work, and I'm sure we'll talk much more about that. I'm also the producing director of The Team, which is a small uh, experimental theater company based in Brooklyn. Um, and what do I do it for? Such a good question, and something I feel like I need to ask myself more frequently, and something I, when I am in feeling um, lost, 
like throw my hands up in the air and I'm like, what the fuck do I do this for? <laughs> um, so it's, it can be both a grounding question and a, an existential cry for help question. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, for me, it's, it's just all about community. Um, I'm ex extremely like maniacal extrovert and I, I get a lot from being around people, but I think more than anything else I see theater as an opportunity to um, create a, a connectedness that is like undisruptible by all of the isms and the forces that would have us be disconnected and disrupted. Um, and, and that it's a, an opportunity to practice um, like deep supported relational existence that can translate to how we structure our families and how we like live next to our neighbors and how we participate in mutual aid networks and how we participate in considering occupation and colonization across the world. And, and so I think like uh, it, it feels like a long-term project and like how people can be together and often that's with each other, with our collaborators and sometimes it's with audiences. If we're lucky, we get to really, really connect with them. Um, and there's something else I wanted to say about that. Um, I can't remember, so for now, that's what I'll share. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Joanna Carpenter. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have a three-pronged identity, I guess. I am an actor, most recently in Sweeney Todd on Broadway. Um, I also work in politics, and I work with asylum seekers and migrants uh, in a language learning capacity. Um, all of those things are oddly kind of uh, inextricable from each other and overlapping in a lot of ways. Uh, I pursue a lot of activism within the theatrical spaces that I'm working in. Um, and I do it simply because I can't imagine my life uh, or purpose being shaped by Anything else? Yes, Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Barbara Samuels. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work as a lighting designer and a producer and an organizer. Um, I've worked all over the country, but uh, mostly I work in New York now. Um, and I would say I I found my way here because I think that the connection that audiences and performers and production find the connection that happens when people share space um, is is like one of the greatest forms of like connection that I've ever experienced, either as an audience member or as a creator. Um, and I think that, so sorry, um, I think that uh, by us coming together and being in a room together when we make a piece of theater and we share a piece of theater, we unearth something about the human condition and we together in that single moment uh, create something new. There's potential for, some, for growth, for something else, um, selfishly, uh, as a designer in particular, I uh, get so much and learn so much about myself and the world through the process of making and collaborating with other people. Um, and um, through all of those experiences, um, I also have become incredibly conscious of the ways that the privileges I carry as I move through the world have enabled me to um, work hard and achieve excellence, whatever that means, success, whatever that means, but also that um, I've, had, I've had opportunities be more accessible to me than they are to most other people. I find that very few, I'm lucky enough to pay my rent, make a living doing this, and I don't think that most people can do that who want to do that. And so for me right now, that's the big driving thing. 
thank you all. Um, I feel like it's only fair to also reciprocate my own. <laughs> Why do I do it? Um, mm. And I think it's very much the same as what you all are rooted in. Um, for me, I feel, it may be cliche to say this, but in the most earnest way, I believe in the world making possibilities of this art form. Um, I think that we get to practice new models of being together in the play space of a stage and a rehearsal room. Um, and I think that we can take those lessons back into our lives, whether that be in our own workplaces um, or to the dedication of our communities. Um, and I believe in the material, right, like the way that a story itself could actually change a person to create new and reverberate new actions in the world. Um, when I think about also the privileges that I've been afforded that have helped me have the very grounded, successful career that I have. It's a lot of serendipitous luck. <laughs> um, uh, connections to people, just being in the right place at the right time to get me out of where I was in the system into a new part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think really critically about what it means to create systems of liberation um, instead of systems of, of oppression, understanding that, right, there's. Uh, aside from revolution, which I certainly promote, if anybody is ready to take up <laughs> arms and change today, uh, you know, we're playing a longer game um, and need to create systems that actually guide us forward, right? Um, so my hope is to be able to do that, to keep digging deeper into what those possibilities are. And I feel grateful that we're going to hopefully, we're going to fix it all today. Uh, <laughs> all of it. I feel it. super excited all of about it. it. Take uh, notes. <laughs> so, Perhaps to get us started here, um, now that we're grounded and, and know who all these people are, um, you know, the, the core of this conversation is really rooted in advocacy itself, um, which perhaps <laughs> means that we ought to define that for ourselves and for one another. Um, so I'm curious, what does advocacy mean to you? How do you do it? I'm gonna throw a lot of questions your way mm -hmm. just to respond to you. Mm -hmm. um, what does advocacy mean to you? How do you do it? What musculature do you need to have or train in order to be a better advocate? Mm -hmm. um, and how do, you, how do you even take stock of or take inventory of like your own power to be a solid advocate in the world? Mm -hmm. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the mistakes that we are often at risk of making, not just within theatrical and entertainment spaces, but kind of as a whole, socioculturally, sociopolitically, certainly socioeconomically, when we think about advocacy, is that we think that there is a uh, non-fluid way, like a simplistic way, uh, a right or wrong way to be an advocate. Um, for me personally, my Stephen Sondheim said content dictates form, right? And so my advocacy will take the shape of kind of piling into the box of the space that I am currently working in. So for example, um, I did uh, The Connector at MCC Theater recently this spring. And that was a very tight box of things that could be fought for. I was a swing and dance captain and um, the off-Broadway contract, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point in this room or outside of it, um, the off-Broadway contract is very, very difficult to work on, even at the highest paid tier. It, at, at a certain point, it ceased to be about what my take home was and more about all of the other things that are products of that type of funding. And so I recognized that my advocacy, which can range from burn it down and destroy everything to how subtle of a conversation I could have. My advocacy in that box had to take the shape of recognizing what was best for the show and finding language that could accommodate the people that I was collaborating with, Bernie Telsey, general management, these people who are so eager to make positive change from a single show to industry-wide. And that advocacy had to take the shape of what would work best within the microcosm of that show. And then you look at things on a bigger commercial scale, certain things that I was able to fight for over at Sweeney that um, ended up being very successful. That was a different conversation entirely, even though the results ended up being the same. And I think when you talk about the musculature, I really love the use of that word. Uh, I think when it comes to advocacy as a whole, we have to be willing to be like water. We have to be willing to not address our assumptions about what the issues are, but really stare 
directly into the eyes of what the issue might be and be willing to stretch ourselves and kind of contort ourselves in a way that allows us the strength and the sustainability to continue having these conversations. And I don't know if that's specific enough, because um, I'm trying not to like name all the names. <laughs> um, but yeah, advocacy is an exhausting thing. Um, but f I think for a lot of us in this room, and certainly everybody up here, I would assume that it's an absolute uh, necessary thing. It's just kind of in your blood, and it's deeply important. Um, there was another thing that you said that I'm trying to remember that's going away now. Damn it. It'll come. It'll it'll, it'll come. It'll come at three in the morning tomorrow. That's what I have Please to say don't about report back that. that. I will send you an email. Yeah. I also wondered. Yeah, I feel like I'm just whatever. I'm like, could we just like take a second maybe to like define advocate and advocacy, like at least as far as what we're actually talking about today. Mm. Feel free to do so. Miss I'm. Miss that's a question. So I'm. Feel to like. Well, I do think it is. The, for me, I think it's a question that I'm, I'm wondering about for all of you. Like, how do you actually think about like what it means to like what is an advocate to you? Like, how are you showing up as that? Assuming that this is the this was the invitation for the conversation today, right? Like, I feel very curious. Like, I know what that is for myself. Mm -hmm. um, which I'd be happy to offer that definition, but I do feel. More I guess like what is yeah, what is like the work of an advocate maybe is like maybe what I'm wondering. Mm. Well, I think that that for myself, I'll say like that depends on the kind of change that you're interested in, right? Like you're advocating for whatever that change is. So, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to jump in and say that I feel like um, the reason I became a producer was because I was a performer constantly finding myself trying to fight for the respect of myself and my peers um, and recognizing my positional power as a white person and as a person who had traveled through communities of wealth and elite educational spaces growing up and felt like I could speak the language that was for some reason demanded in order to even be met in conversation. Um, and producing felt like advocacy as job <laughs> to, to the best of my, right now, my understanding of so what that means for me, what advocacy means for me, is co-conspiring with artists to get the resources to them as directly and um, usefully as possible. And I agree with you that I think the what that means is so highly specific to mm -hmm. every context in which we find right. ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the work of advocacy too is, is, is listening mm -hmm. and understanding what the very specific terms of say an independent show in a, in a small theater in Brooklyn that's being produced for $50,000, what advocacy looks like in that context and, and what resources are available to move and to whom. Um, it looks so different than my role as the producing director of a nonprofit organization where advocacy sometimes means um, defending a choice to spend $100,000 of our savings to the board to be able to move through our mission aligned activity, which mm. is making place. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I think for me, advocacy means like a deep listening and planning and co-conspiring with artists, and then understanding what resources are necessary to make uh, a supported process possible and see how efficiently I can like siphon those resources. And as I'm saying all this out loud, I realize I'm like, have some vision of myself as like the advocacy spy or something, you know, that there's some <laughs> sort of like video game, like totally. cartoon yeah. novel to it all, where you're like, and then I got the money from the, Found it. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, but that's, I think, how, yeah, how I'm thinking about advocacy. Yeah. I mean, would you, I don't know, would you say that you feel like there's sort of like a, a representational quality to, in the, like, or like that you maybe act as like a representative of, like, you know what I mean? 100%. Okay. This is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not like, I'm sure we'll get into it. I don't want to sort of like derail the or original question. You're not. But I guess I'm just Take like. Take where you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I, I don't know. I just think I've just been thinking a lot recently about like you know I'm on this panel about advocacy. Sort of I recently was given this advocacy award from the Dramatists Guild, but I was never like. I never called myself an advocate. Other people just started calling me that mm -hmm. and then invited me to do these things. And mm -hmm. so I think I'm just trying to sort of, for myself, mm -hmm. like figure out what that means and if that's something that I'm actually like interested in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, whatever, if we're already here, we can just talk about it. But like, I guess I just mean like, um, yes, the thing that a lot of people know me for doing is writing this article called $5,000 in which I talk about, um, getting the public theater to sort of increase the amount that they pay playwrights for the first time in mm -hmm. 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think like it makes sense as to why people I think read that and was like, okay, this, like, this, this person is an advocate, this person is sort of engaged in advocacy, we should sort of like, you know, bring them into these conversations. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I guess I, I, I think about how like I didn't, like the process of me getting the increase, I guess you could like, I don't, do I call that advocacy? I don't even know, right? But then it's also, but I also think about like the actual writing of the article, right, is the thing that got a lot of attention because again, people actually knew about it in that sense and were able to like do something with that information, right? Yeah. But the article was like not addressed to theaters, it wasn't addressed to people in power, it was addressed to other playwrights. Yeah. Which is also part of the right reason why it was published in The Dramatist, which is like the magazine of like the trade organization that is The Dramatist Guild, right? Like it's directly addressed to other playwrights. Mm -hmm. And so I think about like, okay, like oftentimes that feel, I mean not even that's putting it, but like that, that is the work that I feel like I'm more interested in is sort of mm -hmm. um, being, in community and also organizing with other playwrights, not necessarily being like, I'm gonna be the one to sort of like mm. advocate for playwrights on behalf of, or mm. advocate to theaters or whatever yeah. on behalf of playwrights. Like, but it does feel like that's a sort of position that I've been put in, um, in a way that some, in some ways I can accept that. Um, and then in other ways it does feel weird to sort of I think I was trying to have sort of a collective conversation of be like, I did this one thing and you all should also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And now I've been put in a situation where I'm sort of like an advocate where it's mm -hmm. like, great, like Ife is gonna be the one to like have these conversations while we're all over here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why I was trying to like frame this conversation around or figure out like, okay, what is an advocate? What is an advocate to, et cetera, et cetera. Cause I'm like, I think I have like maybe a complicated relationship to that, mm. at least at this point in my yeah. life. Well, it sounds like also the, like, the contradiction almost that you're getting toward is also this idea that an advocate is meant to be like a steward of community. And it mm -hmm. sounds like the change that you've made has really been about your, your own personal needs and circumstances and standing in your own beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think the, to me, I see you being thrust into maybe this space of like opportunity toward advocacy for playwrights at large. Right. Um, Cause you did, like, it's like you did it, you have a model, you've been able to name that. But yeah, I hear yeah. that it wasn't necessarily your intention, right? To be like, okay, and now I'm driving, I'm driving all playwrights and the change of their well, labor. Well, I guess I, I did in the sense that like, I did write the article wanting to sort of like drive change, right? Like I did want it, but I guess the change that I maybe envisioned was for other playwrights to also take up the mantle of trying to recreate what I did. Mm. And for me in whatever capacity to be able to support that, not necessarily for then for me to be the one in necessarily rooms like this with a bunch of like theater administrators then talking to you on behalf of playwrights. Do you know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah, well, I don't I think, think that it has to start, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't have to start with the intention of like larger systemic change. Yeah. Like you can strategize towards that as an individual. Um, but again, I think like you don't have to go into change making or advocacy with that intent in mind necessarily. Right. And um, I feel yeah. like there are two things that you said that are really like important to name. One is that like, often advocacy is happening on behalf of oneself in a really small context mm -hmm. and it doesn't become like necessarily industry change making until it is legible beyond the very small context in which you're working until you're saying until you wrote this article mm -hmm. and 
So I feel like that is like an, just interesting for us to flag because it's like how can, how can we name the ways in which advocacies are happening on a more public level so that these roadmaps can be borrowed and repeated and adjusted. And then the other thing I feel like I'm hearing that's interesting is, is how to also resist the kind of like framework of politics where it's like, and now Ife is our like unwilling elected leader right. of playwright <laughs> right. rights. Right. And yeah. like, I, mean, I did not yeah. consent to that yeah. labor, baby. I did. <laughs> like you're, yeah. And, and ha so then how do we, okay, so sometimes we need, I think as a culture, like we kind of need to latch on to representation. For sure, change. I think that's definitely what's happening. One hundred percent is like somebody did something, and they're like, "Great, this person did something. Let's like you know X Y Z." Like, which again, I like understand why it's happening. I guess yeah. Sometimes I just like, like I didn't write the article to sort of like be the poster child for this thing. Like I care deeply about it, and I hope to continue to be involved in conversations about playwright compensation, but like, you know. Mm. Right, even the fact that when it was published, it was like a huge just like picture of my face. I was like, okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's a fine picture, like whatever, but like, um, you know, it sort of, again, sort of already starts to sort of like frame me as the individual as sort of like, here they are, you know what I mean? Or even like, you know, right, getting this award for the Dramatist Guild, I sort of was like, Again, like I did not write this article in order to get an award. I got wrote this article so that, you know, playwrights would, you know, come together and be able to like get more money from theaters. So I'm like Yeah, her. You uh, know? <laughs> for all those if you have not read this article, it is absolutely in, at risk of reifying this yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> cultural labor that Ife has done. It is still worth a read. If you just Google Google Ife Olajobi 5000, it should be the first hit that's up there. It's absolutely worth your time. Um, I do want to, I wonder, Barbara, yes. if you have any yeah. additions to the definition of advocacy for yourself. Well, I'm going to half answer your question and half, half respond. Please. Um, I think that Something that you talk about in the article that I think is also highlighted in what you just said is like playwrights are alone <laughs> in their navig how they how you navigate each individual project. I as a designer feel very alone. Uh, but I don't I something that has been I hate to say groundbreaking, but something that's <laughs> felt groundbreaking in the last seven years is the ways that designers have started talking to each other mm. and both within our individual categories and as teams. And then we've been able to, or it's become a priority in my practice to talk to the other people who are potentially a part of my team and build solidarity because there is their strength in numbers. And I, to me, that's one of the major offerings of your essay. And I, it brings up questions for me of like, what are the ways that playwrights and directors who are, who are often going a lot of these negotiations alone, ways that they can um, provide solidarity for each other through these, like, through these challenges? Mm -hmm. um, my other non-answer to your question is, for me, um, I really, I bristle at uh, the word artist. Um, I think that the word artist, in particular in this country and in under capitalism, is used to exploit the people who make the things. Mm. Um, and so for me, uh, and I, I, have the, I have this note from some conversation I was having about this. Uh, a friend said, it's surprising the coincidence of abuse and creativity. And um, that's on a post-it on my desk to just remind myself mm -hmm. of like, when something feels off, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I really try to think about, I, I've spent a lot of work uh, building an identity as a worker. I should have said that when I introduced myself earlier. Um, and 
I would say like as I uh, go deeper in identifying that I'm a worker and a craftsperson, also because on most projects in the American theater, I as a designer am not the generative artist. Mm -hmm. And so as a, by identifying as a craftsperson, I also think it helps me stay passionate about but depersonalize mm -hmm. a lot of my work so that I can dramaturgically and artistically become invested in the thing that we're making, but by depersonalizing it and understanding the work better, I'm able to set better boundaries for myself. I'm able to communicate my need. I feel that I've, in growing that power, I've been able to better communicate to myself and to the organizations I work with what my needs are. Um, and and talk to other people who I might be working with about those things. Mm. Yeah, I'm obsessed with all of these definitions. Um, I also find myself very, when I think of the positions I've been put in where I am able to like steward the experience of not only myself but other workers, I, I often find that it just is about asking, asking questions about like where was the decision, like who, who made the decision for us to exist in relationship to one another and space and the space of creation in this way. Um, and is that actually comfortable in my body, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think by asking those questions and hopefully revealing to one another as like coworkers and colleagues, um, we can create more like consent-based spaces where instead of feeling exploited in our labor, which is so frequent, that we are actually like, yes, I can say yes to this work and to all the creative output that I'm offering in this room and still feel whole in myself and my body and my values. Mm. Um, when I think, yeah, that, that's really how I think about like this marriage of culture change in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we have such a plethora of industry identities here. Like we, we almost cover, uh, we cover quite a wide breadth of perspectives, um, positions in the field. Um, so I wonder also like, what do, you, what do you all think is like some of the main challenges from your perspective uh, main challenges of workers in this field? We're only here to ask the hard yeah. <laughs> the hard hitting yeah. questions. Something I'll, I'll just something that I've been thinking about recently is as a person who builds budgets for projects is um, how readily we will pay, and, and I, I feel like I should say that I'm working in like the downtown small organization and small production space. So as I start to say numbers out loud, that is the context. Um, but that there is a readiness with which a small, an independent production will pay an electrician $35 an hour. That is never the rate at which we will pay an actor for their time mm -hmm. or a designer for their time in that show. And it's because I, as I'm making this budget, I'm like, I know I will not be able to find an electrician if I do not pay them $35 an hour. Mm -hmm. Can I find an actor who will do the show for $1,500 for the entire show? Yes. That is not the basis on which I should decide I'm gonna pay the actor $1,500 and I'm gonna pay the electrician $35 an hour. So mm -hmm. what I've been trying to think about recently is how to A, healthily assess the time spent by every single person working on any production and, and how, to, how to name quantifiable time, like hours that your body is in a room, you've been asked to be in a room, and then what uh, I think Janie from New Georgia's offered to me as a really useful term, which is soft time. Mm -hmm. So like the time that you're spending learning lines on the subway mm -hmm. or like uh, having a phone call with a director because something doesn't make sense to you or, and, and how to wrap all of that up into basically like an assessment of the hours spent on a project and then take what I think is a respectable hourly wage mm -hmm which is again, not that respectable, but within the context of where we're working and how much money we have available, mm -hmm. and add that hourly wage back up and see where I land. And often the total is, is a lot higher than, 
the fee that was initially going to be mm -hmm. offered. And so then I have two choices. Either I say, we have to figure out how to afford that number that we just um, added the hours up to, or we have to figure out how to pull the hours down. Mm -hmm. And so that's an exercise that I'm, that's very specific exercise I'm, I'm trying to do these days, especially within the context of independent productions. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to name it to the artist so that we're on the same page as to what we think it's going to, how much time we think this job is going to take, and say that's how we got to this total number. And if once you reach, you know, like 10 hours before that total number of hours, you let me know. And if we're like, you know, say it's the video programmer or something, and it's day one of tech and you're like five hours away from the total hours we've estimated, like we have a problem on our hands. Either I have to say, okay, we have to do this show without a video programmer because I haven't built a budget that accounts for the reality of that, the duration of that person's labor, or I have to figure out how to get you more money. Mm -hmm. And so that is a kind of small thing that I feel like I'm trying to integrate into my working practice so that there is an opportunity for mutual accountability towards how your pay is being arrived at. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's an offering. Yeah, I think transparency is always a good tool. Mm -hmm. um, and I find, again, like for me, there is something about getting to a consent-based practice mm -hmm. where uh, certainly we need to be paying one another more. Um, people need to be able to meet their con material conditions. Mm -hmm. And I also know that there's, we, we like to do a lot of assuming in culture. <laughs> um, and some people are able to give more time than others. Mm -hmm. That's a reason that they're also privileged in that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there's something huge about giving people an opportunity to say, okay, I understand this breakdown, and I'm gonna therefore, I can say that this still fits in my principles, mm -hmm. certainly. Are there problems from your perspective in this field? I think that's one of the biggest problems, honestly, is sort of between what the two of you are saying, mm -hmm. is like transparency is maybe like an umbrella under which a lot of other problems can fall, which mm -hmm. is just that like there is, and that's transparency, you know, from theaters or producers to artists and other theater laborers. That's transparency among ourselves as artists and theater workers. Like, there's just, like not a lot of like sharing of information happening, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is, I think, preventing a lot of um, yeah necessary conversations that can lead to like meaningful change to for people from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you know, that's like, I can, right, even I just did this play at the public and like I was never told what like the total budget for the play was, right? Even till now, I don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Like that's really fucked up, right? <laughs> and like even in um, me trying to sort of, right, advocate for more money for not just myself, but sort of all the playwrights for that season, like, there is, I don't know how whatever I'm asking for sort of fits into the larger budget of like what my play costs, what these other plays cost, whatever, like mm -hmm. sort of we came up with a method to determine what we were gonna ask for and I mean that goes back to like um, conversations about just like frankly unpaid labor that playwrights are asked to do. Mm -hmm. We're not paid for rehearsal time, tech time, any of that. We're just sitting there for like month, month and a half not being paid for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sort of that was the genesis of the conversations. But again, like, I, you know, with a team of people, we were able to sort of like come up with like a number which was, I guess, you know, $15,000. Um, and then, um, yes, $3,000 like rehearsal stipend. And then um, $2,000 like health insurance reimbursement. Like, that was sort of the total landscape of. Mm -hmm. The payment, but that was based off of like comparing numbers from some other theaters that we were able to get access to and whatever, mm -hmm. not based off of any internal accounting from the public or whatever was going on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a lack of transparency there, just like oftentimes, I think like, um, I think all artists involved with the production, but I think playwrights specifically sometimes are just like completely left out of these conversations. Mm -hmm. Like we have no idea what's happening. Um, even like designer budgets, like I have kind of an idea, but I don't actually know what each department's individual, but or I think I know what our costume designer's budget was because it just like was not nearly enough and so we had to like go back and forth with them to ask for more money. But like as for everybody else, like you know, you're just like not told any of this information, at least at that particular theater. I don't know how um, 
other theaters will operate. But like, so there's that. And then there's also the problem of transparency among each other. Mm -hmm. Like, again, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a lot of these conversations started for me back in like 2022 mm -hmm. when I just like so happened to have like three readings in the course of like two months mm -hmm. at these three different theaters. And so I was able to sort of like look at actually the amounts that they were paying me. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was like, right, like, the Bushwick star was offering me like $500 for a one day reading. And then um, MTC, what, no, yes, MTC was offering me $500 for a week long reading. Mm -hmm. And then the public was offering me $425 for a week long reading. Wow. So I sort of was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, and which of those organizations has the smallest budget? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. For, for those at home, everybody in the room is aghast. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I was just like, this does not make any sense for so many reasons, but also it's just like, there's no way that theaters are getting away with paying these wildly different amounts unless they're banking on the fact that playwrights are not talking to each other about it. Because it just doesn't make any sense. It literally makes no sense. Yeah. Um, and then, right, so I'm sort of like realizing all of this is happening, being like, oh shit, we gotta do something about this. And then, um, right, so there was a conversation with a bunch of other theaters that we can maybe get into later, but also in the process of trying to get the public to pay me more money for this reading, I emailed um, Maropi, who uh, was formerly a producer at Soho Rep, and basically was just like, hey, how much do you all pay uh, playwrights for like a, st and this is all like standard industry, like 29 hour week long readings we're talking about, except for the one day reading, obviously. But so I'm like, yeah, what's well, kind of the rate for like a 29 hour reading? And she's like, yeah, we pay people $1,000. So I was like, again, what is going on here? Um, but I was like, great. I had heard that Sora was paying thousand dollars, and that oh, uh, I feel like I'm gonna forget the theater. Was it? I don't know if it was Second Stage or somebody was also paying people a thousand dollars for a twenty-nine hour reading. Mm. So essentially, I was just like, great. That's my number now. Every theater, I'm gonna ask for a thousand dollars, and sort of went on a whole process okay. of doing that. Which again, we can sort of like get into that later. But essentially, just me just saying like, there's a huge transparency problem. There's no reason why like. A theater that's like down the street from another theater should be paying these wildly different amounts. These theaters that have like completely incomparable budgets should be paying wildly different amounts. And the fact that I'm just finding this out in the normal course of like trying to be a working playwright in the world is, you know, it's like I'm not the only person who has access. To it. Like you all know this is happening, so why are we just now talking about it? Mm. Yeah. Um, anyway. So I think to tease out, I think like a big the a big takeaway in a lot of what you're saying is like. Uh, we are not budgeting in, in a con like a context-dependent way. Like there's a problem in the the infrastructure that uh, Soho Rep, which is a three about a three million dollar organization, uh, is paying any sort of equivalent or higher rate than like these other multi-million dollar, mm -hmm. like closer to like fifty million dollar organizations in some contexts. Mm -hmm. um, that feels like a we're, so we're not budgeting truly to our actual overall budget, I think is a big thing. I'm also curious, and I know that there's, you know, not just you, but for anybody in, in this panel as artists as well, something I hear a lot is like, oh, we don't want the artists to be thinking about the money. Like, we don't want you to be burdened with this. What? So I wonder, like, what do you say to that? Like, what do you say, and what does it change in your creative process? What would it change in your creative process if you were allowed that kind of access to information? A lot. <laughs> I, mean. I hate being told that so much. Yeah, it's very right. condescending. Yeah, I was gonna say. So it, I think it's. Yeah. I think it's meant to be. I'm. I'm going through that on a project right now, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I happen to know that 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 project is like a nonprofit, but that is also backed by some billionaires. And so I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. if you want to be like that then we are gonna ask for everything. But I also can tell from the early conversations that other people are having on the pro have had on the project that we're going to have to fight every mm -hmm. step of the way, mm -hmm. regardless of the vague awareness I have that there's a lot of money mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. uh, the organization. Um, I, th I think about this a lot also because I hate that. I want to know that information. I'm 
excited when this happens very rarely, but I'm excited when I work on a project and not only do I learn what the other designers are getting paid, but I also then, mm -hmm. uh, but also I know what everybody's proposed budgets are um, because, you know, we're talking about organizations that could have a $250,000 operating budget, but also maybe have a $50 million <laughs> operating budget. And, um, and so it's helpful to like contextualize that. Mm -hmm. um, but also a lot of these bigger organizations budget years out. And those mm -hmm. budgets don't necessarily reflect the scope and approach to the creation of the actual project. Yeah. And so I, I feel very lucky that I've worked on some shows where we get all of the information early and then the designers and the director put our heads together and uh, negotiate moving the money around on the different budget lines to, and this, is, this has happened in a few different ways. I, I'm saying this in terms of like, there wasn't enough money for the costumes for your show. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's great that they found more money. Maybe on a different show, there's too much money. Like the set doesn't need to be that complicated. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we put the money into the clothes or like us as a group of designers and director decide what our priorities are for mm -hmm. our production mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make, have the opportunity to make a counter proposal or like, you were saying earlier, Sam, give consent that we, that like our priorities for the production are aligned with the, or institution, producing institutions, mm -hmm. priorities for the production. Mm -hmm. I think I, I made an attempt at, uh, in, in producing um, shows presented at Soho Rep this <laughs> fall. I was really mindful of that experience that I have as a designer and so, in addition to sharing with the designers, everyone who was hired, I don't know, it was three months, two and a half months before we went into tech, anyone who had already been hired for the production was invited, with, shared on the budget, and then was invited to Zoom conversations to ask whatever questions mm -hmm. they had about the budget mm. um, so that they had time to review it, time to not just like, you know, um, for me, as a designer, I might know what my materials budgets are, I know what the labor budget might be for my assistant, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much money there is for labor for the production mm -hmm. staff and technicians who are supporting me and who, like Emma mentioned, are frankly getting paid a lot more than me usually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but then to be able to understand that greater scope and ask questions and be curious, I think um, what was exciting about that for me as a producer or what's exciting about that for me as a designer is it's an opportunity for education on both sides. Because um, maybe I'm talking with, as a producer, maybe I'm talking I'm thinking about this also, I think education is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this also in terms of some projects that I have worked on where um, I'm working with actors who have never had somebody like talk them through what a contract, what they should be looking for in a contract. Mm -hmm. yep. And so like taking the time to uh, not just like ask them to sign it, take their time to sign it, but actually understand what these sections are um, so that in, a, in, and in that context, it's like in a smaller, it's been in a smaller space that those folks are then equipped when they get a bigger job offer mm -hmm. to know what they're looking for mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. for what they need. Um, mm -hmm. I lost the thread in what I was saying <laughs> a little bit and yet it was such a gift. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I yeah. think there is such intersectionality to what everybody's coming from and what everybody's yeah. bringing with their perspective. And the particularly around um, transparency of anything that has anything to do with anything money, which is literally everything in this <laughs> industry, um, but also the education factor. Coming at this from the perspective of an actor, uh, 
going back to tie this into your prior question, one of the probably biggest issues that the average actor faces is an oversaturated market mm -hmm. full of people who do not understand the economics of this industry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a way to fix the oversaturation because schools and uh, conservatories make money by pumping people through this carousel of programming and kicking them out the door and going, you're gonna go work for Disney, it's gonna be great, babe. And that's just not real. <laughs> the I can count, I've been in this business for a long time. Mm. I can count on less than one hand the amount of actors I know who can tell you what a P&L is. Not what the line items are contained within a single sheet, but what is a P&L? The average actor you ask is like, the fuck is that? Because we're not taught, also I didn't go to college, hi. Um, but <laughs> we are not taught what this math is, therefore we cannot ask for what we need, therefore we cannot do our own personal analysis of having a producer who decides to be transparent and honest come to us and say, this is what we can afford to pay you, not period, end of sentence, but this is what we can afford to pay you for this amount of labor and here is why. Mm -hmm. A, what you're talking about is very non-existent except in the smaller spaces because the other thing that this all ties into that I don't think we've actually phrased out loud yet is power a lack of communication, a lack of transparency, a lack of honesty or clarity about budgets, especially when it trickles down to the actors who are frankly at the bottom of the totem pole. I'm to like, unless you're a star, you are the last thing. And I understand that, I personally am okay with that. I understand where I fit in the machine. I'm so sorry, I'm talking so fast. You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm heated. But it's, if we as artists, in whatever way we identify as an artist, are withheld and kept away from the transparency because that is power, that consolidates power, usually from the people at the top who have the money, so there's that trickle down effect. If we're not talking about these things, and if we can't find small ways and means to educate ourselves about how the money works, and again, from a performer's perspective, that's one of the most empowering things I have ever done for my own career, is sit down with a company manager and say, okay, why? Why did my contract shake out like this? And have this person stare at me and say, because they didn't want to buy the costumes for you to cover that role, and instead we kept you here, and also we put you on a temporary contract because we didn't want to ya da 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 And, we don't have to like the reasons behind it, but we do have to talk about the reasons. And I think in this industry, money is power. I, you know, people can get mad at me for sounding overly cynical, but I don't see a change. It's kind of a larger thing. I don't see a change to the consolidation of financial power at the top. I don't see us changing that. We are not going to mitigate capitalism. That's not a thing that we are going to do. Um, however, sorry, it is what it is, but however, all of the machinations and the way that we move through our various tiers of the hierarchy within this industry, talking about what you were talking about, simply saying the quiet part out loud can sometimes have a ripple effect, naming a thing, talking to each other, you going to your actors and saying, this is what I need you to understand. You make your best professional decisions based on this. But transparency is like the weapon that not many people are weaponizing mm -hmm. at all. And the producers, and I'll say this for the admin folks in the room, the managers, the producers, the creators who have the power to have these conversations, to the willingness, the interest, and in getting pulled aside and receiving questions like, hey, why couldn't I get a bump because of this? Because I'm covering this many tracks and I know we're favored nations, but all of these things, the willingness to have the conversation, those are the, the pinpricks that are going to add up to what becomes clarity and power trickling down in a healthy, sustainable way and communication and this synchronicity and like cohesion between all of the factions of this industry, which honestly, I'm, maybe I'm the only one, and maybe because again, actors are at the bottom of the totem pole, but it feels like all of our departments are very disparate. Mm. Like, Yeah, for an industry that's mm -hmm. like rooted in collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the human I experience, <laughs> like we're not yeah. humaning with each other. Right. And like, you know, I, I understand that I'm weird because I have a fascination with the math, 
but I think every actor should. Because just because that fascination is not imparted to us as important as playing the role and getting the job, like mm -hmm. the mental health toll, this is the thing <coughs> is, as an actor, if I understand that I did not get this job because of a myriad of numerical factors that have nothing to do with my humanness and my artistry that I brought in the room, the freedom that gives me from taking responsibility for not getting the job for whatever reason, that that to me feels like liberation, even if it's only momentary because neuroses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Winding pile of tangents, but mm -hmm. like power is power and transparency are so, so huge. Yeah, I would love to dig deeper into this power, power mm -hmm. question. Because mm -hmm. um, I while I certainly understand your analysis, mm -hmm. I think from where I sit in the industry, uh, particularly as an institutional producer mm -hmm. and my experience in in producing and like sitting in that kind of like, um, you know, regardless of where I am in the org chart of the producing structure, mm -hmm. that's certainly a leadership position, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I, I bristle, to use that language a little bristle, um, I bristle when I hear artists also speak about their own power as like, right, sure, our, we can say that actors are lowest on the org chart, mm -hmm. um, and, and like, I think we should and ought to be thinking about like, where do all of our laborers like fit in yeah. our organizational analysis? Yeah. Um, totally understand that. Agree that when we're thinking on that in that kind of context, that perhaps there's that, that there is this perception of lack of power. Mm -hmm. um, and I also find that um, again, this is not an attack of what you said, but I'm like, I think that it's like perpetuating a kind of like patronizing view of like empowerment and agency, right? Like I certainly hope to be leading spaces where people feel like they um, can activate their agency at all times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's difficult because there's a relationship to risk. Um, but I say all of this because when I think about how I create change as a producer, mm -hmm. um, I can advocate all I want to my institution and say, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. But until, frankly, an artist comes mm -hmm. and says, I want this to change, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's actually very difficult for me to steward that if I am not in the highest position of authority mm -hmm. trying yeah. to make that shift, right? Like, yeah. um, yeah, so it's it's like getting this information from other workers is mm -hmm. what allows us to create that kind of systemic shift. Yeah. So I wonder, I guess, I, I'd like I, I'd be curious to hear you all speak a little concretely to, you know, in those moments of advocacy for you, where you are positionally, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you push through, you know, that tension of like I don't have power, mm -hmm. I can't do this, there's a risk here, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does this make sense? Well, you named you named the thing. Yes, it makes sense. Thank you. You named the thing, which is uh, risk, proximity to risk. Mm -hmm. And I know myself, and because I am privileged in the sense that my entire life does not revolve around a single show that I'm in, um, I will be an artist until I die. I will be performing when I, like, drop dead at age 110 and have to be carted off stage. I planned it all out, I'm so excited. Yeah, it's gonna be great. That understudy is gonna be so traumatized. Um, but the, I know that because of the machinations of my personal life, I have less of an aversion to rocking the boat because it still really is seen as rocking the boat. I have less of a personal aversion to that when I know that I am, going back to our original term, advocating for what is right in the moment. Maybe not necessarily just right for even me, but right for the greater whole within that that show, that space, whatever it is. I don't know a lot of actors who are comfortable with that, and this goes back to what I was saying before about scarcity. We, I don't know what we do to fix the scarcity, and when we are constantly, it is either brazenly or subliminally reinforced that more often than not, it is not safe for us to speak up because the likelihood that we will burn a bridge, lose a job, et cetera, et cetera, is still too high and we're never guaranteed another job. I think risk, of, not to overly simplify my answer to this, but risk mm -hmm. aversion is pervasive and it is toxic and it's very, very real and mm -hmm. it's very, very valid. You know, where you said you are in a position of power in multiple ways, right? Like you can be, uh, a light for voices who maybe cannot reach the people that you can, therefore you being able to translate what another artist comes to you with and pass that up the chain, that's power as well. 
So the question then becomes like, how do we get more artists being comfortable saying, this causes me hurt, this is not working for me. Um, and especially at the commercial level, which is where I'm thinking of, you know, like how the, the conversation around like a health and wellness stipend. Mm. A, a swing that I worked with, who's a vacation swing over at Sweeney, came to find out that like we got a, a generous health and wellness stipend, like $100 a week. Like, it was amazing. It was massages and voice lessons and whatever you want. He was never told that he got that, and he spent almost a year working on this show and never got to have that conversation. So then he went to company management and was like, nobody told me this was a thing that I got, and they were like, sorry. Mm. You know what I mean? And he was so afraid to kind of like go to bat for that. Um, and also right, rightfully pissed off because this was information that was not given to him sure. by multiple factors. But all of that to say risk aversion. Yeah. Risk aversion. Barbara, I see you wanting to jump oh, in. Oh, I had a clarifying, I have a thought, but I had a clarifying question. Yeah. He didn't know that he got that. Does that mean that it wasn't in his paycheck? You, it was a like reimbursement a system. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, there's some benefits so to that. Much. Because it's yeah. then it's untaxable. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I definitely um, prefer. But then, yeah. but then, no, but then you, yeah, yeah. But take what, wasn't in the, what wasn't in your story was mm -hmm. an offering to then submit those receipts from the last year. Correct. Right. Because right. they had a timestamp <laughs> on them. Mm hmm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Sorry. I think, I, I, I think that um, I think that people are going to be disempowered, and uh, something that was said earlier about listening is really, I think, asking questions and listening. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. For many people I know, um, like my first my first comment would be. People in power should ask people with less power what they need in order, in, not just in order to come to work, but in order to thrive mm -hmm. in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that could look like a lot of different things. Yeah. Some of my thoughts are, you're working late, pay for cabs for people to go home, mm -hmm. provide, provide funds for childcare or on-site childcare. Mm -hmm. um, for me, as a designer, a lot of the time, that's more money for an assistant because um, then my assistant is able to be more engaged long term on the project. They're able to build a higher investment in the project and um, I don't have to limit the volume of work that they take so much and therefore I don't get so burnt out. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's about money for me and sometimes uh, it's about money for other people to support who are supporting me. Um, but so much of the time, I think we've become so accustomed to not having things that we need that I, I say listening, mm -hmm. maybe watch, watching and listening, mm -hmm. as well as asking, because um, there are certain things that I think people wouldn't even think to ask for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would, mm -hmm. like, one of the things that I've started in the last few years really asking for is um, places to have meetings. Mm. You want me to be at tech at X time? Well, I have to work on these other shows, so I have a meeting in the morning. Or like, hey, I'm in therapy. Mm -hmm. I need a private place mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order to have my therapy session. You want me to be in the theater at 11 a.m.? Yeah. I, the only way that's going to happen is if, uh, if these other offerings uh, are made available to me, mm -hmm. but um, that sort of came out of me deciding the theater doesn't own me, mm -hmm. and if the theater wants to behave in a way, and saying, I know I'm speaking about organizations like they're people, and that's maybe helpful or not helpful, but if the organization wants to set a schedule that kind of owns my life, then I need there to be a push and pull mm -hmm. in order to make that work. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I used to just like not sleep or, or, or um, take a cab to have the phone call in a car and then not tell anybody I spent the money and then feel stressed right. at the end of the month. Yeah. I used to compensate yeah. in all these ways and it's taken me a while and um, uh, but it's taken me a while to build up the knowledge that not just that those things don't have to be that way, but that I can ask for those things. And I think that that's come with um, a seal of approval by the industry that I'm like mm -hmm. a per that I'm like a person who is actively actively working and I think actively liked in a lot of contexts. And like then I'm like oh this organization things are going well, so like now I can ask for what I need. But it I. I think I was in the field for, I don't know, over 10 years, maybe 15 years before I started identifying the things that, the material things that I needed yep. that were going to make me feel more comfortable. Yep. Um, that if somebody had asked me generally or had said, hey, we have this idea, we have like a spare dressing room, or there's an extra desk in our office if people need to use it, if someone had just like generally said that in an introduction meeting, I think it would have like cracked open the idea that like, hey, if I need something, I can go mm. to, I can, I can ask for it. Um, can I ask yeah. you a couple questions? Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm, so I'm curious about two things. One is um, this, thank you for all of that. I'm like taking notes over here. <laughs> um, when you say, I have this the shared instinct to start a collaboration with like, what what do you need to be successful in this or to thrive yeah. in, in a working context? And so I guess my question is, if I know on some level, uh, I don't know completely concretely, but I have a sense of the limitations of what I can offer, mm -hmm. is it better to start with like a pie in the sky conversation or to start with uh, a set a, a offering of, of some of the bounds within which we'll have to figure out how to help you thrive. Yeah, I think some boundaries are good. Mm -hmm. I also think what Joanna really spoke to and is a piece of this is like the question, what do you need, is so general mm -hmm. That I think for some, some people are going to have really specific answers that like may or may not be feasible, mm -hmm. and like I know right now I have a feedback form sitting in my inbox from a project that like wants to know like how the process went, and the questions in it feel big, mm -hmm. and so I'm scared and it sits in my inbox. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's like a diner menu. <laughs> <laughs> but, like too but, big. But I like really <laughs> want to give the feedback. And, the, and I'll, I will also say in that case, the questions are big enough that I feel annoyed about the labor, the and uncompensated labor yeah. that's gonna go into the response. And so I'm in a bit of a feedback loop for myself about, yeah. <laughs> about that. Yeah. But, um, but it's because that feels, it feels like big questions. What do you need is a really, is a big question. And so that's where I think like, asking the question, but also listening and... In addition to your pay, yeah. um, some are just automatic, like the daily wellness items. You don't have to request those, they just come. Mm -hmm. And others are by request. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's, we start to get into this equity territory, right? Of like, not everyone needs the same thing mm -hmm. to show up into the room. And so, um, have, sitting with the, the reality that it, it might be okay that one person get a caretaking reimbursement and not another because maybe their partner is a banker mm -hmm. and can cover the caretaking costs themselves or... Um, Anybody single and a banker? <laughs> 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 but I guess, um, I, I just, I do think this starts, it, it creates a really like deep and important conversation and a tricky conversation around like, okay, so if you offer this thing to one person, mm -hmm. do we gotta offer it to everyone? Mm -hmm. And I often think the answer is no, but mm -hmm. having the, taking the time to have the detailed conversations that allow you to arrive at that. Mm -hmm. And obviously if you can, great, sure, offer it to everyone, but sometimes that's not the best use of resources. It's sort yeah. of blanket offering. Um, 
I don't have much more to say, but I just yeah. feel like you cracked open the equity conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, which this is also like about the conflation of equality versus equity, right? Like, yeah. 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 not everybody yeah. needs the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think, to, for my brain, that also cracks open a conversation about unions, which is maybe just like a can of worms we don't. Um, I mean, we can open it. Wait, Listen, <laughs> but if you've got something to great. say, I'm happy yeah. to hear it personally. But like <laughs> equity, Oof. the union, does not always make it easy to have conversations about equity. You're so diplomatic. The idea. <laughs> so well, also it's like the, the idea even of a union is about creating a universal standard that yeah. everybody has to uphold, which yeah. does become very, I know that for me it becomes very difficult in like a newer universal context. Universal baseline. Exactly, sure. like minimum. Uh, yeah. Just to be like, yeah. Yeah. not to nitpick no, your words, but my experience is that minimums are maximums on contracts in the lived, mm -hmm. in, in the lived world, mm -hmm. and that is not what those minimums, those minimum rates, I'm speaking as a member of United Scenic Artists and mm -hmm. not, I can't, I have negotiated contracts with other unions, but I'm most intimate with our negotiations. Um, our minimums on our rate sheets, 75% of the time, I'm speaking nationally, not about New York, but, um, that is that is the fee, mm -hmm. um, and there's not there's, so just just by setting minimums as maximums, mm -hmm. we're um, like that's not like an idea that's coming from the union. I think is the thing I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. Union is agreeing on base rates in a collectively bargained agreement mm -hmm. with a trade organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I also, I really appreciate that clarification too. I think it's important to be a bit more exacting in our language as we're building. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, perhaps the better picture is I think beyond rates, I know that I find myself um, struggling often with the relationship unions create to the kind of, literally the kind of collaboration you're able to have because of demands mm -hmm. of uh, and, and rules, right, about, and regulations about like the structure of time you can spend, yeah. all of which are hopefully, right, about honoring the labor and the worker. Mm -hmm. um, that part I certainly agree with. And it's, and it's about like, uh, not everything works for everybody. Yeah. Communities are different. We might not be building in this, right, like I, I think that there's a push and pull that I often find myself in, 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 in regards to um, that kind of creation of space together. Mm -hmm. Um, totally. I feel like there's like, I don't know, yeah, there's so many things that have been said, so I'm to like, but I mean, right, just talk about union stuff. I mean, writers don't have union. We're not allowed to unionize. That's a whole conversation um, <laughs> that we can have. Um, but I think, yeah, to your point, Robert, it's sort of like this thing of like, Right, I sort of, as a, as a writer, I can see the ways in which having some sort of standardization would be helpful in a context, right? Um, and some way to actually just like, even if it is a minimum as maximum, be able to defend that in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, or even this conversation with the public, like they didn't include, increase the rate in 12 years. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why they changed it is because I showed up, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Otherwise it would have just kept going. Mm -hmm. So like these are situations in which I'm like, okay, union would be helpful. But I think Sam, what you're saying as well, like, you know, I think about right beyond sort of like compensation too, like even right the way that we work, right? I'm talking about these readings, these 29 hour readings, like that's an invention of actors' equity, right? Playwrights didn't come up with that, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of playwrights have a lot of questions about these things and how they work and like just new play development in general a lot of it is sort of like, right, dictated by these sort of different tiers that are usually set by the actors union. Mm -hmm. And so then we sort of are here sort of going along with that because like we have no other choice. But right, we also don't have a union that's sort of like being like, actually we think reading should go this way because this is what would be best for our writers. Like we don't mm -hmm. have anybody doing that. Um, and so we're kind of right in these situations where Right, we're kind of just going along with whatever the received wisdom is or whatever these people usually do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, right, it goes back to this conversation we're having too about like, okay, then when to sort of speak up and like what are like the risks of 
saying, hey, actually, I don't, this isn't working for me. Like, can we do something else? Um, I think, right, Sam, to your point, like, I think there was um, a, your point about um, power and sort of like, right, that artists actually sometimes, you know, have to be the ones to kind of come into a situation and and say we need this to change because I was kind of pretty directly told that by this person who worked at like LCT3 basically like you know I was going off about as I usually do um, about theaters needing to pay players more money mm -hmm. and you know was going off on a whole thing and then this person was like yes like you're totally right like we hear you um, but basically we just right basically said we need uh, we're waiting for like the playwrights or the artists to come in and like say no, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like we know that like probably we need to change X, Y, and Z, but we need the the artists to come in and sort of like, you know, refuse to continue unless we do make that change. And I'm like, okay, that's messed up for a lot of reasons, yeah. right? Like, mm -hmm. A, because like you're telling me you know what you're doing is wrong <laughs> and that you're not going to change it unless somebody comes in and tells you to change it. Mm -hmm. But then there's all these factors that you're talking about that like sort of, that, that I think are also coming from theaters, right? That are sort of preventing people from feeling like they can say something because they don't want to lose opportunities, right? So like all of that is happening. On the other hand, okay, there's two things. I guess on the one hand, I do, I think we do need to question some of those fears, which is something that I've been talking to a lot of playwrights about. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, I think that's the thing is like, oh, we don't want to speak up cause we don't want to be labeled as this or we don't want to lose the opportunity or whatever. But I'm like, okay, like at least for me talking to other playwrights, I'm like, name one situation where that actually happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean? Right. Like name one situation where a playwright went to a theater, asked for more money and the theater right. was like, get out. Yeah. Give me the data. You know, like yeah. that, I've done that many times at this point and that hasn't happened to me. Yeah. So I think we need to be real about like, okay, like what are that, what are we actually afraid of here, mm. right? And what are, what is like literally happening mm -hmm. when we ask for more money, right? Mm. And I think there's just like, right, the destigmatization and then like the releasing of fear in those contexts. Mm -hmm. And I think a thing that can be helpful in releasing that fear is operating in groups and operating yes. in collectively, yes. right? And I mean, some of that goes back to sort of like a union conversation of like, okay, what are the ways that a union can be helpful to artists organizing, even if the union itself is problematic, which it seems like many unions and theaters are, but like how can maybe that be uh, a conduit to facilitate um, groups of artists getting together to try to sort of like advocate even in these small scale ways? Yeah. Like when I was doing these things for the readings, like I kind of, uh, there were a couple of situations in which I was in these sort of um, whatever writers group, the like resident writers groups at these different theaters, like at Ars Nova, I was in their like play group. And so in that situation, I was able to kind of just like reach out to the other members of my cohort and be like, hey, um, I guess there were like whatever, six of us for that year and just be like, this is the information I found out. I think we should ask for more money for reading. Mm -hmm. And then so the six of us were able to sort of like come together, mm -hmm. brainstorm, figure out what we wanted to do, and then sort of like go to the theater as a group. So like that obviously reduces sort of like the fear of being like, you know, sing feeling like you're gonna be singled out for something. Mm -hmm. And there's other situations in which, like at MTC, I was part of a reading series. I didn't know any of the other three playwrights, but I just cold emailed them and was like, hey, like, again, this is the information that I've been learning recently. I think that we should all get together and ask for more money. I know that you don't know me, but mm -hmm. this is what's going on. And they all agreed, right? Mm -hmm. And granted, like, you know, I think definitely from an institutional standpoint, they were able to identify me as sort of the troublemaker. But, <laughs> um, yeah, but I do think that operating in these groups has been really helpful. And for me, is like a way to move forward. I mean, this is like, you know, going back to sort of like, you know, just like organizing like labor movement stuff, like all of these yeah. things like happen in groups of people, right? So I feel like, and you know, to these conversations about, right, like how do we, how does a producer or an organization be like, okay, what do you need? I think there is like individual conversations that need to happen, but then it's like, right, I don't know, how does sort of, um, 
I think on an individual production, right, like artists can feel isolated because like often, like right, there's like one playwright on a production, mm -hmm. right? Or even if there's one lighting designer, even though you have like an assistant or you might have like a small team, it's still sort of like you're doing whatever. But I think, right, these cross um, disciplinary conversations mm -hmm. Uh, do end up being really helpful, right? Um, or even I remember being in one reading room and like, right, I was trying to ask this theater for more money and like during like breaks from rehearsal, I would just be talking to the actors about it and be like, y'all, I sent them this email yesterday and this is what they said. And the <laughs> actors would be like, oh my God, this isn't that, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, then they would tell me about like uh, different reading experiences that they had had. And so like, I also then learned a lot about what they were being paid at different theaters. And like, I think it's like, you know, and I don't necessarily have a perfect model for this, but I'm like, hopefully there is a way that sort of like, even within a particular production process, artists of different disciplines can sort of like, check in with each other about what it is that we need and also learn things about each other and then also be able to kind of like, go to a producer or a theater in a way and be like, hey, we all got together and talked and like, these are things that would be helpful to us as like a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there can be like the individual check-ins of like, okay, I actually need childcare or I actually need mm -hmm. this like private room or you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. then also mm -hmm. there's like a, a, a bed of people around you who mm -hmm. can help you in tracking accountability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. around yeah. all of that. And then there's also the vulnerability that I think is really valuable and like, and, and it's scary, I've been there, for producers to, to have to step into knowing that all 10 people sitting in that original check-in room know that that person over there said, mm -hmm. I need $200 to get a cab to and mm -hmm. from the space every single day because otherwise I will come to the space burned out already because it takes me this amount of time to get there yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like it, it, it creates a really like high stakes of accountability which, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. motivate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to wrap, I think, this part of our conversation and move us to another question, mm -hmm. but I think some thoughts I also want to offer to the room. Um, one, gossip, so important, um, <laughs> actually helpful. There, <laughs> there is like actual genuine yes. community value to mm -hmm. this sharing of information. Again, not for exploitation or demeaning, but actually like building a collection of data. Mm -hmm. um, I also just want to, again, activate everybody's agency. Um, I think particularly marginalized folks were taught that we do not have power. We learn that we do not have power socially. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think some great advice that I was given at one point, I don't want to move with the violence of this, but somebody once told me, move like a white man in the world. And I was like, hmm, um, which is to say, like, have the audacity to ask a question, mm -hmm. um, have the audacity to sit in your principles. Mm -hmm. You might find actually that people are more willing to engage with you than not. Mm -hmm. I also want to say only, only you an individual can know what your own risk level is. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things we've identified in this conversation is a difference between right commercial producing mm -hmm. and nonprofit producing. What I could tell you is true of a nonprofit structure and the kind of hopefully human-centered values that exist in that structure. Um, as a producer who wants to see this world, who is also advocating for pay equity, mm -hmm. who is also beholden to the power of institution and not the only singular decision maker, mm -hmm. I can do my best advocacy when I also have allies mm -hmm. in the artist's room. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lesson here of like, identify your allies, mm -hmm. don't feel like you have to do something alone, mm -hmm. and also know that there are institutional employees who are willing to shoot themselves in the foot to help you get to the space mm -hmm. that you want. Mm -hmm. I certainly feel like one of those folks. Um, and I also just wanna like, I don't know, I wanna encourage us all to like divest and demand. If some, if some place is not, the reason I say, say this too about like have the audacity do it is like, especially as a nonprofit employee, if somebody threatens to quit, mm -hmm. if somebody is like, great, I'm not gonna do this job because you're not giving me X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. I am activated <laughs> yeah. to do as much as I can humanly do mm -hmm. to meet those demands, right? Mm -hmm. And to make that kind of change. Mm -hmm. I do think I, as in a, an institutional position of power, have, um, a responsibility to excavate further into systems of liberation, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I, I, it is this like, it can't, I can't do it alone, you mm -hmm. know? Um, there is, I think, something that can also be offered. And I don't, yeah, I really um, always wanna emphasize, like, I, I do believe that we all have more power than we think that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can take inventory of what you believe to be true and maybe just find a comrade who you can go to and say like, 
are you also experiencing this? Mm -hmm. Are you also interested in this? Mm -hmm. um, the work can hopefully move forward. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of this said, I think we've like, you know, we've complained, <laughs> we know what the problems are, we want pay equity, um, and we understand that there's, you know, instability in all of the systems and infrastructure uh, that al that's allowing us to achieve that. I would love to know, um, what are your hot takes for the changes uh, that are needed in our field to achieve this kind of sustainability, this holistic monetary sustainability, human-centered sustainability. Um, I am particularly interested in things that maybe, you know, people would <gasps> um, dare, dare you think of it, um, something that, you know, uh, the normative structures that be are even unwilling to consider. Like, do you have, do you have a thought of how we achieve this that, um, yeah, you think would drive us forward? <laughs> Emma's got a little smart. I have a, I have a list. Oh, a list? <laughs> oh, 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 give me the list. Yeah, oh, brought the notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for I'll also say, sorry, yeah. just for time's sake, we have about 15 more minutes Great. of dialogue to go. I'll, I'll try to be yeah, how long? <laughs> uh, produce fewer shows and pay people better. Mm -hmm. um, people over things. Mm -hmm. um, something as some of these conversations uh, were happening over the last few minutes. The other thing that I thought, oh, maybe people don't know this, is the costume designer is always the most exploited person. Mm -hmm. They always have the least labor mm -hmm. and the least, uh, they, don't, they often don't have a place to store their things. Mm -hmm. They are carrying everything around. Mm -hmm. A big educational thing for me has been uh, lighting designers mm -hmm. in the last 40, not totally historically, but in the last 40 years, has been a predominantly male uh, area. Mm -hmm. As a result, over many years, <laughs> there has become a lot of material and financial and labor support that goes into the creation of my part of things, and costume designers are still have like, that can be true, and then the costume designer has one person helping them, mm -hmm. and they have to like trudge everything around the city and the number of, and it's all connected to women's work versus men's work and mm -hmm. how that's manifesting. Mm -hmm. So give more money and resources to costume designers uh, and wardrobe people. Mm -hmm. Have to figure out the laundry situation. Um, <laughs> all theaters need uh, <laughs> This is connected, I guess, to fewer shows. But stop trying to put movies and TV shows on stage. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. We don't have to go more into that. Um, ending on paid internships, I think, was really great, but they have, we need to figure out what the model is to replace that with. Mm. Mm -hmm. How are we training people? How are we Who's training people? Mm -hmm. um, there is no door, no one can find a door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have um, to say, I have like very specifically in this conversation, not a single clue where our next managing leaders are coming from mm. at all. <laughs> I think I see, I, I feel like I have a good sense of like artistic leadership and mm. coming up, but I'm like, who, who's the next managing director? Not, not mm. sure. <laughs> um, I, I said some version of this earlier, but if you want my feedback or you want me to promote the show, pay me mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. More specifically, I feel that way. I mean, I'm curious about this. It's so outside my my journey. But a lot of the time, actors are doing like Instagram takeovers for a day or a weekend on a run of a show. Mm -hmm. Is that in their contract? Are they getting compensated for that? That's a lot bigger than me sharing an Instagram story, which also maybe mm -hmm. I should be compensated for. Mm -hmm. um, and this. A, a word that got said earlier was favored nations. Mm -hmm. And I want to put out into this room and into mm -hmm. the live stream that favored nations is completely inequitable. It's <laughs> bad. And mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. you can find me on the internet. I <laughs> reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about why and how, what some ideas are of how we could be thinking about things. Mm -hmm differently in terms of how we think about paying people within a production and across the season, because mm -hmm. the favored nations line has been given to me in both versions. Mm -hmm. um, we pay all the lighting designers this season mm -hmm. the same amount. Mm -hmm. 
regardless of what the production is or what the ask is. Mm -hmm. We pay all the designers on this production the same, but I, as the lighting designer, um, am there for tech and for X number of meetings. The costume designer, the set designer, they're doing, usually, months more work mm -hmm. than I am doing. Um, that is my, so that's, those are the things to start. Nice work. Great takes, mm -hmm. right here for it. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will climb on my little soapbox mm -hmm. and say, <laughs> small is all. Mm -hmm. I really, 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 really deeply, really believe that the, the future of theater is in small organizations, mm -hmm. like we're talking under three mil, mm -hmm. because that is where agility lives, mm -hmm. and that is where the response mm -hmm. to everything that has been named in this entire conversation mm -hmm. is like actually implementable. Because often, too, in a small organization, like the producer has a very lived human relationship with the artists making the work. Mm -hmm. And so they can exercise this intuition that you named earlier of like, okay, we don't know how to respond to what do I need, but if, if, the, if you're in a small organization context, the producer is often in the room and can absorb the information necessary mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. respond to it later in the mm -hmm. process. Um, and also just like, you can change Ooh, policy. Can we hold for a second? Oh, yeah. I want to make sure accessibility-wise, yes. our interpreter's camera just fell. So we're just going to make sure everybody's all right. All right, I think we can keep going. Thank you for that pause. Thank yeah. you to our tech who is supporting yes. this panel. <laughs> and to our interpreters for their patience. Back yeah, I guess um, I, I think another thing that's important is just that like in smaller organizations, it is easier to like create policies in response to something that feels really urgent in one year and then mm -hmm. fucking get rid of the policy and create a new policy and then create mm -hmm. another policy and like, it's just flexible, and and the red tape you have to move through to make change is lesser. And I also like I, in these larger institutions, a huge percentage of what the budget is being spent on is the fucking massive, hefty overhead mm -hmm. that has accumulated to just make the thing move, mm -hmm. which leaves very little money left for the art making. And so, also in these small organizations, they you can be a little bit more intentional about how resources being divided between overhead and art making. Mm -hmm. And like, and I don't also like, fucking overhead is, I'm just cramming all these humans into one tiny word. Like that is, that is human resource, that is massive, that deserves a lot of support. And so we can also untangle what overhead means and be respectful <laughs> to that too. So that's <laughs> i just i feel very passionately that small organizations are our future oh, we need no. to What's happening? <laughs> it's happened again we're haunted <laughs> small is not wanted at all <laughs> the ghost has an opinion i'm just proud to end it on that thank you thanks okay i have, I have um, a response to that but i'll yeah. wait until they i think we're set it. and back up thank you everybody oh okay. sure um yeah, I was just gonna say, that sounds great. <laughs> I agree, no, I mean, I think I agree with that, and I think, I will say, I think I've been, you know, in terms of all the things that we're talking about, in terms of, like, right, how to create better working processes and transparency and pay equity and all these things, like, I feel like it's been easy, a lot easier for me to have these conversations with the small organizations that I've worked with being probably, like, a Soho rep or a Bushwick star. Oh my God, not the snail fell off. Um, <laughs> oh. But uh, don't worry, I'll fix it. <laughs> it's okay, we got it handled. Um, but right, I remember talking to the Bushwick star around this reading and being like, right, even though the amount that they paid me, I was happy with, they were gonna pay whoever directed the piece. Right, they were gonna pay me five hundred dollars. They were gonna pay whoever directed the piece a hundred dollars. And I was like, for twenty an hour for one day for oh, a one okay. day reading. <laughs> Ooh, uh, still not great, but still not exactly. So I like emailed them and I was like, hey, like this doesn't feel great. Like I don't feel great reaching out to a director and offering them a hundred dollars for this mm. kind of work because it is a one day reading. But like obviously, right? It's all these hours that they're doing outside of the reading that also in also because we basically had to cast it ourselves. So like, there's a lot of work that they're doing. A hundred dollars does not feel right. So. But it was like the response to that was so like, 
Right. They like got back to me and were like, you know what? You're right. This is something we've been thinking about. We like had a Zoom meeting about it. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know what? Let us like think on this and like th see what we can do and get back to you. Like two weeks later, they're like, okay, we think we can pay them three hundred dollars. And I was like, okay, like wow, thank you so much for like really actually taking this in consideration and doing the thing, right? But I think it's because of the smaller organization. And I was just like talking to three people and was able to be like, hey, like we were able to just like work through it together because it was like, right, this more manageable size and scope and like, yes, so I agree with that. I also agree with like, we need to stop doing favored nation stuff. It does not, it like is just a sort of combination of two words that sounds really nice. Um, the nations are not favored. But the nations <laughs> are not. They are not. Favored, honey. You can't just make. It's also not legally binding. Right, exactly. Even though it is framed that way. It, but theaters will literally be like, yes, this is our policy. And it's like, okay, but how did you arrive here? And they don't have an answer for that. You know what I mean? Like, and I mean, that was the thing I forget who was saying, or I think, right, you were saying about like asking why. Mm -hmm. Asking why is so, so, so vitally important. But yes, favorite nations needs to go. And then the third thing I will say is that, um, yeah, I don't know, whatever. Like I said, for me, again, as somebody who sort of got into this arena by just being like, okay, me as a playwright, I'm gonna try to make change in these ways. And I'm also gonna speak to other playwrights about how maybe we can work together to make change in these ways. Like, I think I personally, like, I, you know, as a maybe, you know, worker category, think we need to sort of be a little bit more, selfish isn't the right word, but sort of like concerned with what's going on with us in a way, because I, I just feel like a lot of times when playwrights in particular get into conversations about what do we need and what do we want mm -hmm. in pay and otherwise, the response by so many people is sort of just like, well, what about the theater and what about this and what about that and the budget and like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, yes, all of these things are important. We need to like consider sort of like the bigger picture, but like it just actually feels like we can't get through a single conversation without being asked to consider other people's needs when we're just trying to talk about our own needs. Mm -hmm. And so something I'm also trying to do is say like, okay, we actually just need a space for us to talk about what we need without anybody else's input or intervention. And then once we can come up with that, mm -hmm. then we can take that into conversations and be like, this is what we need. That's what you can offer. Mm -hmm. Now we can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we haven't even gotten to the point where we can just like have our own separate mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. And so that is what I would like is to actually say like, actually don't talk to me about what's going on with the American theater because I actually like don't care right now. Mm -hmm. Like I need to be concerned about what's going on with me and my fellow workers and me and my fellow mm -hmm. playwrights. And like once we figured out what we need, then we will go come to you and then we can talk, right? Mm -hmm. So, Joanna? Yeah, my hot take might be unpopular, um, but I don't think that there is or should be a one size fits all program or program answer, solution to something that can be technically distilled down into a single concept. So like pay equity, there's not a one size fits all solution to it. So. I think the best thing that we all can do in this room, um, in whatever way our personal toolkit allows us to, is to be focused on staying curious and intentional about how we can humanize uh, and educate the people that we are collaborating with or want to collaborate with in the future. And that's everything from choosing what show you're gonna do, to working out the contracts, to how you hire, to whether or not you provide childcare. Um, I think those are the tiny bricks that will lead us eventually to something that feels like equity, um, but it's done in the micro moments and it's done in the micro spaces. It's kind of like there's never a finish line for racism or sexism. Mm. There's just not gonna be a finish line, but what dismantles those things is the intentional humanization of each other in moments where we might not have otherwise. And to do that, we just have to be curious about what shape that might take. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll make my own offering and then I'm gonna close this out here. Mm -hmm. uh, not to put too fine a point of it, but I think my hottest take is the do less to do more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a bit unfortunate, I think, that like, right, capitalism demands that we grow and we grow and we grow. That's yeah. what we've seen our institutions do. And now our biggest institutions are facing a dilemma mm -hmm. where they are cutting costs by cutting a full production. Mm -hmm. um, and that just, and then that over, whatever that money was is just dissolved back into the universe, right? Like it no longer exists. My call would be, while you still have the time and the opportunity, right size your capacity. 
consider what your overall budget is. Yeah. And if you can cut a production and redistribute those resources so that all of your productions and programming are better supported mm -hmm. sustainably, mm -hmm. you might create a more a, a, a longevity for yourself um, that keeps everybody in your institution whole and maybe also gives them bandwidth to say no to other things, to offer more opportunity to other people, right? There, there, there is this, people here do less and they hear scarcity, mm -hmm. but I actually think there's such an abundant nourishing possibility if we are actually then able to spend time, capacity, resources mm -hmm. in all of our own spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I think with all of those takes, I just want to express gratitude. Gratitude to you all um, for all of your knowledge and all of the work that you're doing in the field um, to make change, to advocate for a better pay, and therefore, again, create systems of liberation for one another. To me, that is really the material root um, that we've been talking about this whole time. I want to express gratitude to our tech team um, who's made this panel possible, to our interpreters who've <laughs> helped make this accessible, um, to Art New York and the staff here for holding the summit. Thank you so much. And of course, to all of you here in this room and all of you at home who um, are the reason that we keep doing this. I hope you got some lessons from today that you will be able to activate in your own spaces. Um, and with that, I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you.